Hello, and welcome to Plugged In, a podcast by Okefenokee REMC about our co-op, our community, and our shared connections. I'm Michelle Hutchins, your communications and marketing coordinator, and joining me today is our general manager, John Middleton. Hi, welcome, Michelle. John. So today we're going to talk about going green and kind of what it really means. More or less, it's going to be a conversation much like you and I often have when I've seen a headline about latest EV policy or mining for batteries or power supply and kind of wander in and talk to you about just kind of perspective and how it impacts us more more locally. And so today we're going to take some of those a little casual conversations we have and roll them into one and kind of give our members a, a better sense of here's what we're hearing in the headlines and here's what the reality of how that will most likely roll out. Um, so let's talk about EVs first because okay. they're the one making some of the biggest headlines right now. Um, we know that there is a huge push to make the transition to electric vehicles and there's incentives and tax credits and auto dealers are all are transitioning some of their plants to just produce EVs with some idea that we might get there by 2050 and California wants to get there even sooner. When you and I talk about this, it's uh, not, not, it's not quite as easy as it sounds. And no, it's not. So tell me why you think that, why it's not as easy as it sounds. Well, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, I guess, first of all, uh, even with the uh, ind individual incentives uh, to purchase electric vehicles, they're still very expensive uh, as compared to, uh, you know, gasoline vehicles. Uh, the charging infrastructure, particularly in rural areas, is is not in place. Uh, there, therefore, these vehicles aren't convenient uh, for many people to utilize. And uh, I, I think that uh, uh, some politicians have set some overly aggressive timelines for this conversion uh, to EVs. Well, we know ourselves from having just done a member survey that 88% of our members do not have any intention of purchasing an EV um, anytime soon. Um, so it, it kind of, it's almost like it's a, 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 there's not necessarily a big demand for them. But one of the things you and I talk about a lot of times is the batteries and they take raw materials and where those raw materials come from. I think one of the interesting facts I learned one time when I was driving into the office one day and I was listening to the radio and they were talking about it is when we talk about these lithium batteries, um, it's not just one mineral that makes a battery. It's several. Yes. And so the, the, the raw materials for the batteries are one issue. Uh, where will those come from? Uh, and then when you look at the motors, necessary for uh, uh, the electric vehicles uh, and the the metals the, the the nickel the cadmium the copper uh, you know we're talking the need for hundreds of millions of batteries just in this country alone uh, so you know wh where does this increase in commodities come from and and even more concerning to me is you know who will we who will we as a nation rely upon to supply us with these materials well and that's that's kind of the interesting the interesting part about it is the united states is viewed as one of the biggest consumers potentially of uh, of the end product but the raw materials come largely from elsewhere china indonesia uh the congo australia right <laughs> And that issue is twofold. And in some instances, we don't have the raw materials here. Right. But uh, some of the raw materials we do have, but the regulatory environment driven by environmental policy, I don't think is going to allow us to produce uh, 
those minerals here in this country. And to get what we need. Yeah. So we, we didn't say this at the beginning, but one of the things you and I often talk about is that um, our climate policy is driving our energy policy right now. Uh, pretty much everything, in my opinion. But, yeah. And not to get too political. <laughs> well, but, no, uh, no. It's, but, but there's, you know, what is behind it? What, you know, why, why are the incentives? Why, uh, why, why the goals? And I mean, there are some very, as we know, it's the, the, the um, worldwide conversation on climate change and climate control and carbon suppression. I mean, those are all headline headline news on a regular regular basis. Um, but the flip side of that is, you know, the environmental impact. And what we don't often hear about is the environmental impact of getting those those um, raw materials to make the batteries. Precisely. And um, so it, it's just. And and I and and not to upset the apple cart too much, but I I know in and a lot of the information that I sometimes see comes from Wall Street Journal, sometimes from the BBC, and you also see it on your you know on our mainstream media as well. Um, but you know a, a lot of the cobalt that goes into these batteries comes from the Congo, and and that that is not machine dug, that is hand dug um, by men, women, and and children, and that's a part of the story that doesn't get a lot of attention. You're right. Um, and I think it's important for people to realize that there's more to it than just getting materials and batteries. But like you said, I mean, a lot of it's coming from elsewhere. And geopolitics is certainly a, another hot topic is, are we going to have access to those? Right. Uh, and, you know, China has moved aggressively in the world marketplace to, uh, to in many instances lock up many of these uh, supplies of, of these mineral ores that are necessary for this conversion to EVs. Right. Because, again, it's not likely we're going to be mining in this country large swaths of land. As it's, yeah, I think it's unlikely, and certainly it's not something that's going to happen within the next 10 years or so. I mean, it, you, if you look at a large-scale mm -hmm. mining project, it, if it was green-lighted today— you know, you're probably talking 10 to 15 years before it goes before well, there's any meaningful production. Exactly. And that is, you know, that is something else you and I talked about not too long ago is that, you know, to get the mines to the point where they're producing what we need to output the vehicles and have the batteries. And, and actually, some of those minerals are not just for EVs. They're also for wind turbines, yes. <laughs> which, you know, we haven't even gone down that road at the moment. Um but yeah, that we we needed to start ten years ago. <laughs> so meeting a twenty fifty deadline is uh, really realistic, you know. No, and and you know, I read uh, just a couple of days ago. I was reminded that with the uh, current administration's CAFE standards, which are the the fuel mileage standards, uh, I think that about forty percent, thirty to forty percent of the new vehicles sold in this country. Uh, must be EVs by 2026, and that increases significantly by 2035. Uh, I don't know how that happens. Yes, and, and, and then California has a bit more aggressive schedule of its own, which is sort of ironic given, you know, in the last six months, they had, with their, it was either six months or this past year where, they were having the fires, and they were telling people not to charge, and, and, and they were having rolling blackouts. And, you know, if they're going to increase the number of electric vehicles they have on an already strained infrastructure, that's not going to go over too well either, I would imagine. I had a family vacation in California last year uh, during September. It was quite warm, and they were constantly running public service announcements on television asking people to not charge their EVs to reduce demand on the electric yeah. system. Well, and I think that's the part we you don't understand. And the purpose of this conversation is not to be anti-EVs or anti-renewables, but to just give kind of a reasonable, realistic view of the situation. Right. I, I wouldn't want anyone to have the impression that, that I'm opposed to EVs or opposed to renewables. I think they are... Uh, a big part of our s solution going forward. My concern is how how aggressively 
we're doing that, and it's it's all being pushed by government mandates coupled with incentives. And you know, that we'll we'll talk uh, a little bit later about you know the electric infrastructure, but sure. uh, I, I have some real concerns about reliability and cost because of meeting these seemingly arbitrary timelines that are being put out right there. and kind of the point of our our conversation at this moment in time is that we've we've got the government has set some goals but realistically do we have the raw materials to meet those goals and and that seems um questionable at best yes. at, at this point in time then the other part of that is you know I, I mentioned you know we did a survey and and you know the majority of our members there are certainly some that have and we certainly see evs here in southeast georgia and in northeast florida i mean i see a lot of teslas actually mm. <laughs> on the on the roadways um but when you ask them well what why why what would what's your biggest concern um, the driving range, you know, how far is it really going to go? Because obviously in, in the more rural areas, there's longer spaces. And then there's the charging infrastructure, which is fairly non-existent at the moment. Um, and then when you get to a charger, will it work? And how long will it take? And um, I think those are all good questions. And I know both Florida and Georgia are, are wrestling with those issues. That's the state, right. the state governments. Yes, uh, here in Georgia, in particular, there, you know, the legislature has uh, formed a study uh, committee that is trying to develop a plan for how do we move forward uh, and increase uh, the availability of charging infrastructure in Georgia. You know, one of the examples uh, about EVs, um, there have been a couple of, I think they were Wall Street Journal reporters. One drove from New Orleans to Chicago, and one drove from. Uh, New York to Maine and both shared their experience in how long they could go before they needed to charge, um, how long it took to charge, if they could find a charger, um, and, and the experience and the expectations. And I know one was done about six months ago and one was more recently. And it was just kind of interesting, you know, what should have been a couple day trip for the plans that the, the one had from New Orleans to sh Chicago took actually four days. Um, while the one to New York um, was much less uneventful. They seemed to find chargers where they needed to and when they needed to. Um, but they, they commented that, you know, the, the amount of miles they could go on a charge wasn't quite the same when they started going through the mountainous areas of Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont in their loop back, um, just because there was a larger, larger drag on, on the motor. So it's kind of interesting to see what's on paper versus what people experience. Well, the, the, yeah, I don't personally have experience with, with that, but I've, I've read some of the articles that you've read, and uh, I, I, range is definitely an issue uh, with the EVs, and uh, the, the range is affected not only by terrain, but also by weather conditions as well. Right. Cold is uh, cold, not particularly cold, good. Cold is, is not good for uh, battery life. Exactly. Um, that was that was part of the experience with the one trip up to uh, Chicago. It was significantly colder up there overnight than it was in, in New Orleans. Um, one of the other issues that we deal uh, quite a bit about with, with our members is solar. So I want to talk about solar energy in the context of... Um, rooftop solar a little bit and then utility scale solar because I mean like Georgia is one of the leading states in terms of utility scale solar and and Florida is also putting quite a bit in um, talk about solar in terms of people think that if they put in a rooftop solar uh, system that they're going to get off the grid, they're no longer going to have an electric bill, and they're going to save a lot of money. But the, the reality is a bit different than that. Well, it is possible to get off the grid uh, with solar. Uh, that takes uh, either a, a great adjustment in your <laughs> lifestyle, or it, it takes uh, battery storage capability, which adds quite a bit of cost uh, to the solar installation. 
Uh, most of what we've seen that our members have installed uh, has been rooftop solar mm-hmm. without batteries. And that doesn't allow you to get off the grid because we all know that the sun only shines half the time at best. Right. And we have seen, unfortunately, a fairly large percentage, I would say, of our members who have installed rooftop solar who have been told uh, by the uh, company that sold them the solar that, you know, their, their electric bill would go away. And that's, that's just not the case uh, in, in almost every instance because the solar arrays don't produce enough energy uh, to offset what's used uh, during peak times and certainly don't produce enough to offset uh, what's used at, at night when, right. you know, when the solar array is not producing. Right, and that does seem to be um, an ongoing issue that we've attempted to communicate with our members about is that, you know, if, if you, obviously, people want to do um, carbon offset, they want to be more green, and if those are your reasons for, for wanting to go solar, by, by all means, you know, um, we'll certainly, you know, help educate you as to what your usage is, what your offset could be, what what size system would, would be um, appropriate for for your use and expectations. Uh, but at the same time, you're actually going to still have an OREMC bill, and then you're most likely going to finance the installation of that system, kind of doubling up on your payments over a 20-year period, which ironically is the typical lifespan of a solar panel. Yes. Um, and, and then also um, cleaning those. I, I know talking with our um, director of engineering, you know, with our solar, our own solar fields, because we have three of them, one out on 82 and one each at our Kingsland and, and Hilliard, Florida office for our cooperative solar program, um, that how clean those are and, and how it makes a difference in the production as much as the weather itself. Sure. I mean, think think about the windows in your homes. I, you know, I hate to wash windows at home, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, at some point they they become just too dirty, and and uh, I, I have to break down and wash them. And when I do, I realize, well, gosh, look at all the extra light I'm getting in here now. You know, it's the same principle with a with a solar array. So, in addition to an individual member, um, you know, deciding to put a system on their their home, I mean. We, as OREMC, in our power supply mix, do have solar power in our power supply oh, yes. mix. Yes, we do. You want to talk about that a little bit? It's not just what we have from cooperative solar, but it, it's part of the mix that we get from... No, we're, we're a member of Green Power EMC, which is a, an entity that was formed by the cooperatives in Georgia to provide renewable energy solutions uh, for the co-ops. And... Uh, Green Power EMC has done a number of uh, utility-scale uh, solar projects across the state, and we have participated in a majority of those to this point. So uh, it is a fairly significant portion uh, of our uh, supply portfolio at this point, uh, but I think it's only about uh, 6% of our energy now, something like that, that we're getting from solar. But, it's, but it, it is growing, and I see that continuing to grow over time. And I, and I think uh, solar is deemed, you know, the, the the thing that makes the most sense in our part of the world compared to, to wind, like you see more out in the uh, west and Texas and, and the plains states. Yes. Uh, you know, th- there have been a number of entities, I think, who have performed wind studies here in Georgia, and we just don't have enough uh, winds to make it, uh, to make uh wind generation a viable option for us so if you look at renewables solar is really the only thing that that we have available to us so you know we have our we have our own solar arrays to megawatts power we have what we're purchasing through through green power and you know we're as a co-op we participate through our statewide in those various initiatives um but like you said if you're reliant on just renewables and making too quick a transition to renewables and not having the backup power, 
then we we could find ourselves in a situation, and it could be not just us, it could be anyone across the country, similar to what happened in Texas with that big freeze a couple of years ago because their wind turbines didn't work because of temperature issues and they didn't have enough backup power from a from a, a instant from because coal had been shut down um and that's why when we talk about a reasonable transition yes we want to support renewables but it's you've got to make sure you're keeping the lights on along the way sure and and, and in all fairness i think it should also be pointed out that the texas uh problems you mentioned uh, were also uh, driven in large part by a flawed market design mm. that they have in Texas. Uh, that is a deregulated market out there. And there was really no incentive under the rules that they had in place for anybody to put in additional capacity. So as their load continued to grow, they, they had capacity issues anyway. Uh, but my concern is is reliability because we've seen a... A uh, tremendous number of coal plants that have been retired mm-hmm. uh, for economic and environmental reasons. Some of that coal capacity has been replaced with uh, natural, uh, excuse me, with renewables, but most of it has been replaced with natural gas fired generation. Uh, and there are some constraints w- with the ability, particularly in the southeast, to deliver natural gas during peak uh, usage times. Uh, You know, renewables are an important part of the solution as we go forward, Uh, but the thing we all need to understand is that renewables alone cannot replace fossil fuel fire generation for the reason we talked about earlier. Uh, We're relying on solar here in Georgia for renewables. uh, And so until we get large scale uh, battery storage capability, uh, then then until that occurs, renewables cannot directly replace any traditional generation. And those batteries, much like the batteries that might go in an EV or the the raw materials that go in a wind turbine, as we said, in other parts of the country, um, are the same raw materials that we need it f- for large-scale batteries um, a- yes. as well. So, again, a lot of raw materials and resources coming from where and and how confident are we we're going to have access to all of those right. to meet the goals that are being set for us by policy. Right. And, and, and on the grid side... Uh, the the problem uh, of batteries is it's almost a double whammy because uh, we have the need for batteries uh, to be able to utilize renewables to replace uh, traditional fossil fuel generation, uh, but then we also have uh, the 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 fact that demand on the grid is going to grow as we electrify the transportation sector. Right. Which is something that we needed to transition to in this conversation is we, you know, right, EVs, because let's face it, most homes are not one vehicle homes. They are, they are two or three. And if we're going to transition everything, that's eventually what we're looking at. Um, you, you talk, we talked about reliability and, and most consumers understand what that is, is that when they flip the switch in their home, there's power. Um, so that they have it when and where they they need it for as long as they need it. But it might be worth just explaining capacity a bit more um, in terms of our system is built for an average capacity and a peak capacity or a peak demand. Um, But as we make that transition, there's going to be more and more demand for electricity, which is going to be more than the capacity we're generating right now. Yes. Uh, well, I, I think I alluded to that earlier. Right. Uh, you know, this this transition to EVs uh, will increase uh, the the need for generation capacity, which is the uh, the capability to produce power uh, to to meet whatever demand is placed on the system. Uh, and uh, again, we we we've almost got the double whammy of having to 
add renewables and, and battery storage uh, to replace uh, fossil fuel generation that, that is retiring. And then in addition to that, again, we have to have to have additional renewables and battery storage capability uh, to meet the increased need for capacity to meet uh, the demand of electrifying the transportation sector. So what's happening at the nat- national level to kind of get the industry, not just co-ops, but the ele- electric industry as a whole, ready for this increase? But, you know, it's going to come at some point in time or another. Um, well, it, it, it is going to come, but it, it's I, – I, I see some – some questions that have to be answered uh, before we get there. Uh, so the conversion to renewables, uh, we can do wind, we can do solar in this country, uh, but for the reasons with, that we've already talked about, they're, they're mm-hmm. not an apples-to-apples apples replacement for uh, traditional uh, brick-and-mortar generation that's fossil fuel-fired. But the other thing is, is, is where do you uh, site renewables? Where do you build them? Well, obviously with wind, you have to, you have to build it where the wind blows. And, and typically, those areas of the country are pretty remote and sparsely populated. They're, they're not near the large urban areas for the most part. Right. Uh, which is, which we, we would call the load center in electrical terms. Uh, so, and then with solar, uh, solar takes up uh, a lot of land area mm. as compared to uh, an equivalent amount of fossil fuel fire generation. So it takes plentiful land, which again is going to be in remote areas to build large scale solar arrays. And again, not close to the load center. Right. So how to, as our need to construct uh, more wind and more solar generation in these remote areas grows, we've got to be able to connect that to the existing grid and be able to move it from where it's generated to where it's needed, which is the, the load centers. Right. And there's a tremendous amount of transmission infrastructure that's going to have to be built to accommodate that. Uh, that's going to be uh, expensive and it's not going to be a short-term or a, or a near-term solution yeah. uh, to be able to do that. And that's just the reality of the situation. It, it you, is. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, Okie Finoki is just over 80 years old itself as a co-op. And, you know, the system has grows and expands as our membership has grown and expanded across rural Georgia and and. and and, and Florida. Um, and as we said earlier, you know, in our area, solar makes more sense because of just the availability and the sun frequency versus wind, which there isn't as much of. But, you know, one of the things that does come up sometimes and that has been observed is, you know, we're harvesting sun at the expense of agricultural land. Well, we've seen a lot of that here in Georgia in particular. Um, you know, it, it, and you know, uh, the the solar developers. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that they are advocates of of renewable energy, obviously. But they're also, you know, they're 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 in business. They're they're, they're looking to make a profit. So when they look at siting options, where where can they build this? Uh, the the most economic place for them to do that is on land that's green field already cleared, ready to go. And we've seen many, many solar arrays built on prime agricultural land here in South Georgia. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I wonder what, uh, as you and I have discussed, you know, where will that lead us as a nation if, if we continue down that path? Well, right. And, and, you know, another part of this conversation we didn't really talk about is not just what's happening here but what's happening elsewhere i mean we we saw last year the war in ukraine really impact um our own uh wholesale power costs and availability of um natural gas and you know it's it it is the other part of the equation 
which we, we talked about from a raw material standpoint, but in general, it's not just what's happening here, it's what's happening worldwide because it's, it really is all interconnected. Yeah, and, well, markets are global now. And, 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 you know, one of the things that we did see in Europe this past winter when things got really bad is several of their coal plants that they had supposedly mothballed, they had to fire up again because of um, pipelines being shut off from Russia because Russia was one of the big suppliers to Europe. And, um, I mean, obviously people need it to heat their homes and, and, and have availability, but, um, it isn't always cut and dry, I guess, is the bottom line. Exactly. <laughs> it isn't always cut and dry. And, and that's pretty much the intention of our, our conversation today is to talk about all these things that are going on in, with energy policy and energy initiatives and, you know, sort of the national NRECA, National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, kind of our overarching advocacy group stance is – we support the transition to all of these different things, but in a very reasonable, well thought out, planned way that doesn't impact reliability and allows for continued grid resiliency so that we can grow with it um, and, and, and not find ourselves with not enough power, rolling blackouts, brownouts, seeing what we've seen in California be the norm across the country. Sure. I mean, when you get right down to it... Uh reliable affordable energy it, it's it's the backbone of our economy the backbone of our our livelihoods and we'll continue to be so and we'll continue to be so yes so hopefully through this conversation we've given a little insight to the myriad of um issues that kind of feed into an impact you know, whether we have EVs, when we have EVs, how far they're actually going to go, how prolific they're going to be in the marketplace, as well as our transition to other renewables and then what that means for our, out, you know, not just at the local level, but the, the regional and national level, the system as a whole. Um, there's many moving, well, they're, they're not really moving, but moving parts to kind of get to work together and play together and... Um, it's just, you know, looking to shed a little light on that subject. It's going to be an interesting time. Well, John, thanks for having the conversation with me. You're welcome. Glad to do it. All right. Take care, everybody.